Hey, you're here. I'm here. No beating around the bush. Let's get going. This is day number 283. Welcome back. Today we read 2 Chronicles 36, Ecclesiastes 12, and our first reading in Matthew 23. So let's turn right away to 2 Chronicles 36. Then the people of the land took Josiah's son Jehoahaz and made him the next king in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was twenty-three years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. Then he was deposed by the king of Egypt, who demanded that Judah pay seven thousand five hundred pounds of silver and seventy-five pounds of gold as tribute. The king of Egypt then installed Eliakim, the brother of Jehoahaz, as the next king of Judah and Jerusalem, and he changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Then Necho took Jehoahaz to Egypt as a prisoner. Jehoiakim was twenty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eleven years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Then King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and captured it, and he bound Jehoiakim in bronze chains and led him away to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took some of the treasures from the temple of the Lord, and he placed them in his palace in Babylon. And he placed them in his palace in Babylon. The rest of the events in Jehoiakim's reign, including all the evil things he did and everything found against him, are recorded in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Then his son Jehoiakim became the next king. Jehoiakim was eighteen years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months and ten days. Jehoiakim did what was evil in the Lord's sight. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim to Babylon. Many treasures from the temple of the Lord were also taken to Babylon at that time, and Nebuchadnezzar installed Jehoiakim's uncle Zedekiah as the next king in Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was twenty-one years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eleven years. But Zedekiah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and he refused to humble himself when the prophet Jeremiah spoke to him directly from the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, even though he had taken an oath of loyalty in God's name. Zedekiah was a hard and stubborn man, refusing to turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Likewise, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful. They followed all the pagan practices of the surrounding nations, desecrating the temple of the Lord that had been consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, repeatedly sent his prophets to warn them, for he had compassion on his people and his temple. But the people mocked these messengers of God and despised their words. They scoffed at the prophets until the Lord's anger could no longer be restrained and nothing could be done. So the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them. The Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men and young women, the old and the infirm. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. The king took home to Babylon all the articles, large and small, used in the temple of God, and the treasures from both the Lord's temple and from the palace of the king and his officials. Then his army burned the temple of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces, and completely destroyed everything of value. 
The few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon, and they became servants to the king and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. So the message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The land finally enjoyed its Sabbath rest, lying desolate until the seventy years were fulfilled, just as the prophet had said. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go there for this task, and may the Lord your God be with you. Let's turn now to Ecclesiastes 12. Yesterday's short chapter recorded proverbial advice to young and old, and that theme continues in today's reading. Ecclesiastes 12 Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and no longer enjoy living. It will be too late then to remember Him, when the light of the sun and moon and stars is dim to your old eyes, and there is no silver lining left among the clouds. Your limbs will tremble with age, and your strong legs will grow weak. Your teeth will be too few to do their work, and you'll be blind, too. And when your teeth are gone, keep your lips tightly closed when you eat. Even the chirping of birds will wake you up, but you yourself will be deaf and tuneless with a quavering voice. You will be afraid of heights and of falling, white-haired and withered, dragging along without any sexual desire. You'll be standing at death's door, and as you near your everlasting home, the mourners will walk along the streets. Yes, remember your Creator now while you're young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For then the dust of your body will return to the earth and your spirit will return to God who gave it. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. Keep this in mind. The teacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The teacher sought to find just the right words to express truths clearly. The words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives the sheep. But, my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful, for writing books is endless and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Let's turn now to Matthew 23. 
In yesterday's reading, Jesus roundly defeated the Sadducees, telling them that they did not know the Scriptures or the power of God. He answered the question about the most important law, and he asked the question no one could answer. Matthew 23 Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms they wear extra-wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra-long tassels. And they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and all of you are equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others enter either. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you are yourselves. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. You blind fools! Which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that to swear by the altar is not binding, but to swear by the gifts on the altar is binding. How blind! For which is more important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and by everything on it. And when you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, like justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, wash the inside of the cup and the dish, 
and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father and our Creator, I pray that my listener and I will follow what Solomon concluded. We must remember you while we're still young enough to make our lives count for something. Let us no longer postpone anything we have desired to do in your service or for your glory, saying, I'll do that when I retire. While Solomon still said everything is useless, his final words show that everything is not useless. He said that you will judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. Jesus agreed in Matthew 12. He said, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You can be sure that on the judgment day you will have to give account of every useless word you have ever spoken. If that is how you will judge, O oh sovereign God, may we not be hypocrites. And may we stop putting off anything you have placed in our hearts to do, and may we be more than ever aware of your awesome knowledge, majesty, and power.